Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time you're watching, whatever time you're listening, welcome to Your Onion Podcast Show. Today we have a very special guest, it's Mr. Louis Louis. I don't know if I'm special, but good morning, well, good afternoon, or good evening, whatever you are listening or watching. Absolutely, this. good evening. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so Louis, like with all my guests, um, I'd like you to uh, basically introduce us to who you are, what you do here, and then take us back in time to uh, you know education and how you ended up here in Qatar. Okay. Well, um, I'm actually Australian from a Lebanese background. Okay. Um, how did started, that happen? Well, it's very it's very common. <laughs> it's very common. There's Is a it? lot of there's a lot, there of, a lot Lebanese of Lebanese living in, oh, in Australia. It's, okay. it's a big community. I hear it's over a million people. Wow. Uh, around Australia, uh, so it's not very something that's very weird, if I can say, yeah. <laughs> if I can use the word weird. So and it's very w- common. And in Lebanon, in general, in fact, we have about three and a half million living in Lebanon. We have over 16 million living away from Lebanon. Wow. So it's probably one of these countries that where you have people from that background living away from the country yeah. more than you have inside. Maybe Ireland would yeah, probably question that's true. that. But yeah, there's a lot of Irish all over the <laughs> yeah, place. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, so I, I was raised, born and raised in Lebanon up until I was around 23. Okay. Migrated to Australia in the early 90s um, after the end of the war in Lebanon, the yeah. civil war. And then uh, stayed there, uh, continued my education. Uh, by training, I'm an architect and an urban designer. Don't ask me how I ended up in sport. I'll tell you a bit later. <laughs> well, yeah, now I'm, I'm very curious. Okay. <laughs> it is. Were, were you always interested in architecture and urban um, design? It was kind of a family passion thing because right. the whole family was working in construction. Yeah. Uh, but my passion was always sport since I was, since as long as I can remember. And was that so, playing sport or actually watching sport? Playing, watching. I mean, in those days when I was young, a young boy running around the streets yeah. around Beirut, not well, in Beirut, in the suburbs. Yeah. Um, what were you playing? We had football, football and basketball usually. Really? Um, these are the two sports where you can practice everywhere. Maybe basketball needs a bit more. It's a bit more challenging. But football, I can remember playing with a Pepsi can or a Coca-Cola can. We don't want to uh, <laughs> do any advertisement here. Yeah, no advertising here. <laughs> yeah, or, or even a plastic bottle. Anything that we could get our hand on, we used to play in the and streets. And is football popular in Lebanon? It's very popular. Really? It's very popular. On, on a youth level, it's very popular. Nowadays, it's probably on a professional level. Basketball is a bit more Oh, really? Uh, popular in Lebanon because of the results. Yeah. Um, and are there, are there any uh, people that we can look out for that are from Lebanon? That we in here, I can not yeah. that I follow basketball or football. Oh, no, no, yeah, yeah, we had. I mean, uh, yeah. there are a couple of people, one of them, uh, I don't want to name names on the show, but we can talk about it off, off air, uh, was the Asian player of the year on a couple of occasions. Oh, really? Yes, so it's, uh, it's not only on a local level. Yeah. Basketball has created a status for itself oh, okay. in Asia at least. Yeah. Um, now they're trying to uh, qualify for the uh, World Cup. Really? And they still have a game, if I'm not, if I can remember, tomorrow, not yeah. today. Um, if they win it, they have a chance. If they don't, Who they, they can playing? go back. <laughs> they're they playing play? Korea. Uh, okay. They lost to New Zealand by two points um, on the weekend. Yeah. That was a very important game. But uh, anyway, we're not here to talk about Lebanon basketball. Are we? <laughs> <laughs> well, so. no, we're, we're, we are here about to talk about sport. About sport and, in yeah, general, absolutely. yes. So, um, so you were playing on the streets, yeah, absolutely. Yes. But you were um, always interested in sport. I was always interested in sport. And uh, even at the university level, I started my university in Lebanon and then I finished it in Sydney. Yeah. Um, in Lebanon, I was very involved in terms of organizing stuff because at the time we were still in a during war mm-hmm. and there was no organized university sport. So we had to do it all ourselves. No, right. We had to okay. contact other universities. Um, we had to actually try to organize things between us and them. It could be just a game. It could be a small festival. Yeah. Whatever we could we could manage with the very little resources that we had. Yeah. Basically, resources were a field of play, whether indoor or outdoor. Kids, that's it. Yeah. There's no money. Even we had to buy our own water. No, wow. <laughs> but it was challenging and it, yeah. was, it was good. Um, after we migrated to Australia, I finished my university there. I was not as involved in uh, pro sport, but I was involved in university sport, mostly at uh, Lebanese community level. Okay, organizing. Organizing, okay. of course. Playing, playing, I continued, but at that stage, that's it. I had no career in, in playing sport, but yeah. it was always a passion for me to actually continue practicing sport. Okay. 
Uh, again, mostly football and basketball, but the focus was more on football in Australia than basketball. I was in a yeah, low-level think... league and all that stuff. Yeah, because Australia, do they play basketball? Are they... Oh, yeah, they do. They, yeah, they, do. they, they will they hate good? you for not saying it. <laughs> 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 they do. They do. Actually, they joined Asia in the last few years, and uh, they've been one of the leading oh, really? uh, countries in oh, Asia. Okay. Um, so, uh, so that's so. But you've qualified you into architecture. Yes, architecture, but you I, still I have a master in urban design. Yeah, yeah. So, um, did you get a job um, in architecture? Yes, I yeah. did. I worked for almost five to six years, and I've, before that, I worked during my studies. I was in the last two years of my uh, degree. I was part time. Uh, working part-time studying okay. in order to get a bit of experience before mm -hmm. I go out to the market. Um, I finished my um, master in urban design yeah. and I never got a chance to even work a minute in it. Really? <laughs> because I joined the Sydney Organizing uh, Committee for the Olympic Games. The yeah, Sydney yeah. 2001. How did, how did that come about? Um, by chance. Okay. I was lying in bed on Saturday morning yeah. and I received a phone call from my, one of my friends saying, have you seen the Sydney Morning Herald this morning? And uh, in, um, in Sydney, the Sydney Morning Herald on Saturday has a section only for employment. It's, oh. it's about a hundred and something pages. I'm not sure if it still exists well, now. Okay. But in those days, it, it was the uh, newspaper to go to if you're looking for a job. Yeah. And he saw an ad that Sydney needed someone who can speak Arabic. And he said, do you want me to continue? I said, no, <laughs> I'm interested. <laughs> so I took the ad from him, applied, went through a couple of uh, interviews and the rest is history. And that was your journey? Into, that, was my, uh, that was the start sport. of my journey into sport. Uh, from Sydney, after we finished the Olympic Games, I shifted to Athens. So uh, what was that experience Athens. like? You know, that, this is your first that was major... major. And it's Olympic Games as well, yes, compared course, to what you were doing before. <laughs> of course, it was... Uh, Did you feel out, out, out of debt sometimes? Did you feel, you know, that... Uh, early on, yes, yeah. yes. I mean, up to the point that my wife is telling me that sometimes she used to wake me up at night asking me, who the hell is this person? Who the hell is that? No, because I was you talking, were talking. I was sleep talking. As that, was, <laughs> that was the stress I was under in those days. And yeah. she was asking me, uh, what is an Olympic attaché? I said, where did you get that from? She said, from you when you were sleeping. <laughs> so <laughs> that's the stress. I mean, of wow, course, as yeah. you said, it's a completely different level. Uh, yeah. I felt out of depth for the first, I would say, couple of months. Mm -hmm. Uh, I worked hard. Uh, what helped me a lot is I got a nomination for Employee of the Year in our department after only three months because I was working like crazy. Wow. And what was and the, so, so when they hired you, what was the lead up time to the actual Olympic Games happening? It was about a year and a half okay. before. So you yeah. got plenty of time to... I got plenty of time to actually, because I was hired as um, a coordinator with uh, Olympic committees, with mm -hmm. the National Olympic Committee. So basically it was a challenging job in terms of trying to please them trying to see what they need and trying to, to fulfill their need. Yeah. But in the same, at the same time, not being hated by your colleagues because they see you as an advocate for the Olympic committees when you are, in fact, an employee of the organizing committee. Yeah. So you get stuck in between both. That was a bigger challenge for me than actually the, the whole thing because yeah. for me it was the first time that I felt like I belonged to an organization, but I still, I still have a strong interest of the... Uh, partners that I was working with outside of the organization to try to, to uh, attend to. So it was not a conflict, but it was like a, a challenge to try to please both. Yeah. But thank God. You, you pulled it off. We pulled it off. And okay. actually, that was my, uh, my thing to do for the, for the next, I would say, eight years after that, working so with Olympic committees in organizing committees. Yeah, how I does said, that work? You know, once, yeah. So once <laughs> you finish at Sydney, the, the... I went to Athens. I how, was, how do they? They actually call. Uh, uh, so they contrary see the people, to what people think. Yeah, you don't actually. Uh, you don't you're just not go, sent there. You just don't go yeah, there. Yeah, because that's the impression that I always got. Then there's a whole <laughs> bunch of uh, people that just go from one city to the next. They, so. Actually, funnily enough, you mentioned it. It's called the Olympic Circus. So it's like the a circus. Olympic. It moves from one place to another, which happens. But, but if you, you have don't have invited. people inside who actually know you and know what you can offer, it's, yeah. it's very hard. It's very hard at an early stage, of course, towards the end uh, of the preparation period. Mm -hmm. As you get close to the games, it becomes easier because they want people with experience. Yeah, of Any experience that's relevant mm -hmm. could help. You don't have to know people by that stage, but then it's up to you to actually build yourself a profile, to build your network of people you can contact. Yeah. You can yeah. drop your resume and say, yeah. look, I'm, I'm looking for a job or I want to stay in this field if, if there is a chance or an opportunity for me to stay. And that's usually how it happens. From Sydney, uh, one of my uh, 
colleagues who was a higher level than me in, in Sydney went to Athens, took the uh, management of the program of the uh, working with the NOCs who are the National Olympic Committees. Yeah. It's not the NOC of Qatar when you take the NOC when you leave your work and you try to... Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, no objection. Exactly. No yeah. objection. No, no, <laughs> no In this case, in our case, it's National Olympic Committee. Yes. Um, he took over the program and he called a couple of us, three of us went from Sydney to there and we formed a team with him. Okay. And, uh, and what after, was your role? I was looking after Asia. Still okay. working with the Olympic committees, I was yeah. the manager for the Asian continent. Right. So from moving from the Arab countries in Sydney to the Asian continent in uh, in, in Athens, yeah. where a lot of the Arab countries are part of Asia. Of course, at the early on, I was also helping with the Arab speaking countries mm -hmm. from North Africa. Yeah. Not only Asia, but then the African team managed to to get that away from us. And uh, after staying four years in, in Athens. Four years. So, four years. So not a year and a half. Now no, you've no, got no. Four it's years. four years. It's, wow. It's a full, uh, if you want, uh, in the Olympic world, it's called a quadrennial. It's a full quadrennial yeah. or a full Olympiad. Okay. This is something I can, I can say it if you like. An Olympiad is not the Games. An Olympiad is a period of four years that runs between the Summer Olympic Games and the next Summer Olympic Games or Winter Olympic Games to the next Winter uh, Olympic okay. Games. Right. It's based on the Summer Games usually. Yes. So I was there for a full Olympiad. So you're living uh, in Athens for in four Athens years. In Athens for four years. Which was with my young which family, must be nice. which was great. Oh, so you're bringing your family each time? <laughs> yes, yes. They, they, they became nomads. just like <laughs> 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 And I want to thank them for supporting because if, if the wife does yeah. not support that, forget happy it. Happy wife, happy life. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So after the four years in Athens, uh, I came to, uh, or we came with the family again. Uh, to Doha to work on the Asian Games, the Doha 2006 Asian Games. Yeah, but hold on, that's you know now you've just gone away from the Olympic Games and you're going, still, you're throwing yourself into the Asian Games. It's, Why? It's almost the same. It's uh, it's. Uh, Did you not want to carry on to the next? What was after Athens? Not really. No? After Athens, it was Beijing, ah. simply because of the family. When our daughter started asking, "Where am I from?" You ask her, "Where are you from?" She tells you from <laughs> Athens. Instead of being, I mean, if she said Beirut or if she said Sydney, I would say, "Okay, yeah. I'll let it, I'll let you go." But to yeah. say from Athens, it was kind of a challenge for her. Yeah. So, and it's simply because of the family. We decided, okay, let's give it a try here. Then okay. we thought, if we don't like it in Doha, mm -hmm. we can always rejoin the. Uh, the circus, if I can go back the to that. Circus. The circus. The Olympic circus. So when did you come over to Doha? What in uh, November 2004, right after Athens. Okay, so they then you got two years. They didn't give me a chance to get a break between games. No. <laughs> I had you only just two literally weeks. throw yourself? Yeah, I had only two weeks because um, Doha at the time had a lot of challenges. They had a, a change of uh, leadership. Yeah. A new, new leadership was there for a few months before I joined. Um, and they were getting a lot of people with experience from overseas. The first, I mean, uh, with Doha, the, the development, the first batch of people came from, Ath from Athens because Athens oh, really? finished before other games. Right. Then they had two, if you want, waves, yeah. not individuals, waves of people coming okay. in groups. Yeah. One from after Torino, okay. uh, 2006. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, one from also Melbourne. From, uh, from Torino uh, was the, win Australia, was that the winter? winter Olympic okay, Games. Yeah. And from Melbourne, that was the Commonwealth Games. Ah, okay. These are the waves. Of course, in between, you get people coming from all over the place. Mm -hmm. But the waves came from Athens, Melbourne, and, Tor and Torino. Yeah. Because you had uh, Olympic Games, Summer Olympic Games, Athens. You had uh, the, winter the Commonwealth oh, Games, Commonwealth, Melbourne, yeah. and then the Winter Games in Torino. Oh, wow. So. So what was your role okay. here when you came over? I was the program manager for the uh, relations with the Olympic yeah. committees. The same. For, for the Asian for Asia? Games. Yes. Well, okay. of course, for Asia. Because oh, yeah, of course, it's Asian. Asian. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> I think you need, a, you need coffee. I need more coffee. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yes, that's how. And then uh, the deal was done with the uh, Secretary General of the Olympic Committee of Qatar at the time that I would try the Asian Games. And if I like it, they will take me in the... Uh, Qatar Olympic Committee. Oh, they were, gonna, they were offering you a job how, yeah. afterwards. They were dangling They're, a carrot. Actually, they offered me even before. I didn't oh, really? have to look for a job. Oh. So I was lucky from that sense, I have to admit. Superb. Did, so, you, did you have to yeah. wear those um, tracksuits? Those lovely, colorful tracksuits? Yes, of course. Of course. Really? Yeah. I mean, being, being in the job that we do, we have a, a double advantage, if you want. We have the formal, the jackets, the, yeah. the yeah. nice jackets that you wear usually in the formal events, yeah. and the tracksuits that you wear every other day. Which, by the way, I love more because they give you more freedom than being in a suit. I know, but the <laughs> colors were just uh, very it's, random. So, 
nice. <laughs> it's like you could spot them a mile away. Yeah, but I that's, 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 the, that's the whole that's idea. That's the whole idea. That's the whole idea. Instead of having, yeah. uh, I'm a volunteer, how can I help true, you on your true, chest true, or on your back? Yeah. You have the colors would actually lead people to you because the whole thing is about helping people. Yeah, absolutely. Once, once any event starts, mm-hmm. the people who are participating in the event don't need you. They know what to do, because yeah, you, especially if you work with them before, trying to educate them, trying to uh, give them all the information that they need. After that, they just want you away from their way unless they have a problem. And if they have a problem, there's no time to look for who's going to solve it for you. Mm. So that's why they need something easy. And usually easy is these days, OK, with the technology and you have your telephone and WhatsApp and all these. Absolutely. But At before, that time, yeah. yeah before, it to was visual. 2006, yeah, that yeah. was on the... You needed to go to an office or you needed to see someone on the street or you needed to... That's, that's what happens. And usually if you have these flashy colors, people are easy, easily added. That's true. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. Um, but how was it... Cha- was it challenging? Because the infrastructure back in those days wasn't as well formed as it was that it is now in Doha I mean yeah in Doha yeah, of course definitely. so you yeah. know was that a challenge um, dealing was, with that it was a major challenge yeah. actually but we pulled it off thank oh, God you pulled it, it was amazing yes, from everybody I mean That's, everybody played their role I yeah. can't say my role was very small compared to other people especially the ones who were building because I came in uh, I came this. in Septem- yeah. September 2006 okay so um, you were here during the so games so I was here oh, during right. the games that's why I remember the tracksuit but <laughs> I remember actually going to um uh, the control center of the Asian Games, which was on the corner of our set, that yes. building there. Yes. And I remember going into one room and it was just full of cables coming from the ceiling. The, the building hadn't, wasn't finished yet. And I think it was the I think it was going to be the media control center. Yes. I think that's yes. what I was showing around. Because the main control center was at the corner, but it was the building next to it. Yeah. I think it was yeah, two yeah. buildings away. But yeah, it was amazing <laughs> uh, yeah. to see. But of also um, the opening night, I was fortunate enough Fortunate, fortunate enough to be on the side where there was cover. Um, All right. Because so you didn't, you didn't get the rain. I didn't get that. wet. I didn't get wet. Where the other side of the stadium didn't have the cover. Yes, of course. And of I course. felt sorry for all the people of on course. that side because it just literally the the um, heavens opened up. And it was a it very was, unlucky year, I have to say, because in that year, if I'm if I remember correctly, it rained almost twelve to fourteen days out of the sixteen days. Yeah. When. Ten years before and ten years after, a train maybe one day yeah. during that period of the, yeah. of the year. So we were very unlucky, but uh, thank God things went okay, apart from the couple of incidents that unfortunately happened. One which led to the death of, of a Korean uh, equestrian athlete. Oh, really? When he fell off the horse and then his horse oh, fell wow. on him. <clears throat> Sorry. And yeah. then uh, the thing that happened, all the mess that took place around the opening ceremony simply because of the presence of many VIPs. And when I say VIPs, uh, oh, really? I never heard any of heads this. Heads of so, states. Oh, really? Well, was, it's, it's well documented. Yeah, yeah, heads okay. of states, there's nothing you can do when you have something like this. Yeah. We tried our best. Of course, we tried as much as we could. But yeah. eventually, uh, in an event like this, and in a region like this, security takes over. You can't do anything. Oh, yeah. No, so apart that. from these two incidents, um, it was great. It left a lot of... It changed lives, basically, for a lot of people. Yeah. And it, it, it left good memories for the people that participated and for Doha as well. Yeah, no, I for mean, sure. I mean, put that, I would say that event put Doha on the sports, yes, on the sports map. Yeah. And it's something that we can proudly say that everybody played a role in it. Mm. The people who were there and who were even, didn't even have a, anything to do with the games because eventually people, when they visit a country for a games, they experience the whole country. They don't only go no, exactly. compete, yeah. run or, or play football or play basketball or taekwondo or whatever. No, mm. they experience the, the whole country outside. So if the, the whole population didn't help, that would leave a bad or a sour taste, if yeah, you want, in, yeah. in the mouth of, of uh, people who come. But, uh, I mean, fortunately for us, everybody was... They, they all wanted it to, to succeed, yeah. and that's what No, the, the, the atmosphere was... Uh, of course. And the vibe was great of uh, during that time. What, what made me... Well, what, what made me laugh recently was uh, someone was talking about an opening ceremony, um, and they, they were saying, or oh, something... Or oh, there's a plan for an opening ceremony where... Um, all the um, uh, all the crowd get uh, special lights that can be turned on and off. Okay. Yeah. Um, centrally, so you, oh, you okay. literally, if they're showing that, you can basically create pictures from 
you know, whatever they're holding up, like an LED. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, So they don't trust the people to do light. it manually anymore. No, but, no exactly. And that just <laughs> yes, reminded yes. me of the Asian Games when we had a box <laughs> under the seat. Exactly, And exactly. I, I remember having had a, the light. a paper dove. <laughs> I think we had a, a light that we could hold. And I think yes. there was various other things in this... Uh, box of course of course and we had to take them out at different yeah, times yeah. i mean what happens i don't blame these people because what happens usually is when people go into the stadium and some people go two three hours before the opening ceremony starts they start flicking and they start playing around yeah, with yeah, them yeah. it's not because of bad intentions they just excited yeah, just curious and excited experience absolutely. everything yeah. that there is to experience in the uh, but ceremony I was just, and they start playing with the lights the first thing that attracts no, people I, is lights <laughs> no but i think it, uh, you know it's just amazing how technology has come of course, of uh, course. since then of course so now they definitely. can literally you know basically people can just hold something up and you and can, you can control you can control yeah, they light it yeah not, absolutely yeah. i mean they can always count on the mobile phone anyway these well, days also. that's true <laughs> that's true um <laughs> So uh, after the Asian Games, uh, joined, how, how joined the Qatar Olympic joined, Committee, okay. and then since have been since uh, 2007 in April, because we, by the time we finished the uh, the Asian Games was in December, we had to do the reports and close of um, you know close all yeah, the, how the long, files. How, how long it took that about take? three months in my oh, case. Three months, okay. Some other people yeah. stayed longer. Some other people finished earlier. Mm -hmm. So it depends on the function. We call it functional area, depending on the functional area you work on. And um, then in April 2007, uh, I joined QOC and have, have been in QOC, Qatar Olympic Committee, since then. So what's your role there in QOC? In Qatar Olympic Committee, I'm the uh, advisor for international relations. And I, had, I was lucky enough uh, to be involved in many of the events that Doha hosted since yeah. 2006, including World Championships, um, for swimming, uh, for um, recently boxing and, and uh, handball. I was not involved in that because we had other projects. Um, but also I was involved in the Arab Games that we hosted in 2011, which yeah. included the 22 Arab countries in the, in the region and many other events. Um, also, I was lucky to work on a couple of uh, community events that yeah. have left a big effect on me and hopefully I will redirect my career towards that, oh, really? that path in, in the next uh, couple of Why? years. Why? Um, one of them, actually, the, the biggest one that had an effect on me, it was two basically, one of them called Active Qatar. Mm -hmm. And basically, it was trying to uh, entice the whole community to be more active, to use sport as a way of life and not as something that I have to do half an hour a day or three times a week, as to do it on a, on a regular basis. Yeah. Uh, but the biggest one was um, something called um, sport. It's actually Global Fund for Sport okay. or Global Sport Fund, GSF. Um, which we tried to change the name later. We called it Global Sport for Youth, mm -hmm. but unfortunately the uh, money dried up, so we had to stop it. What made that uh, project special was that it was a partnership with the UN. So okay. it was not something that QOC was doing on yeah, its own. Yeah, yeah. The actual content was provided by, by the UN, but we helped in developing the content and in actually uh, delivering the content to many countries. We actually had camps yeah. in eight or nine countries. I did not participate in the ninth, but I was in the, in the first eight. And every time we had, a, we had a, a camp, we used to invite all the neighboring countries. So and at some stage, one of them, for example, in Poland, we were there and we had 17 countries, wow. including um, countries that were, were not on good terms. Oh, really? Yes. Uh, politically speaking, yeah, of yeah, course, yeah. once you go into sport, Everybody forgets politics. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> it's just kids working on, uh, you know, playing with each other, working with each so other. So, what were the camps? What the camps were actually uh, the 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 thing is we try to, um, you know, Olympic the Olympic movement and mm -hmm. sport in general has a lot of values. Yes, it can build the character of a person. Yeah, if you do it well, of course, it has its challenges and and danger if you want in terms of uh, taking you know substances that are not legal in order to get to uh, yeah. uh, being an elite level or to, to win simply because of the money. There's a lot of money once you start winning in sport. But if you forget all this, it actually builds your character in yeah. terms of team play. Which company hires someone who does not 
have the, the let's say the characteristic of a team player hardly well, anybody yeah absolutely. you need, you need to so, work as part of a team yeah, of course. you can get that from sport I'm not saying sport is the only provider of that but sport can help yeah. um, respect you have to respect your colleagues if you play in a team sport you have to respect the the, the referee regardless mm -hmm. if, if you think that the if you're against the, the decision that he or she takes, you still have to respect that. <laughs> so that helps you in a way. There's yeah. a lot of uh, excellence. You have to always try to reach the best that you can offer, regardless if that best gets you to win or to lose. Mm. If you're always at your best, people will respect you. And of course, in a job, that's the same. You don't have to always succeed. But if you always give your best, people will, will love Absolutely. Uh, working you get with the you. Respect from hard work. Yeah. You can't make it without training, no. without hard work. Yeah. All that stuff you get from sport. So that's what basically that program was. It's actually to give lectures to kids, young kids, di different age groups. We had different age groups, but basically from 11 till about 18. Yeah. We used to have camps based on the age group, not all that. Because an 11-year-old cannot really play easily with an 18-year-old. No. They have different kind of oh, physical yeah. ability and all that stuff. So we tried to group them. Um, so we used to give lectures. Let's say one lecture would be about respect. One lecture would be about team play. One lecture would be about uh, doping. Not to tell them, to, mm -hmm. to show them the dangers of, of doping and of, of taking uh, illegal substances. And then we try to translate that into the field of play. So we used to use only team sports for that. Yeah. And we used to have our own rules, which we called fair play rules, yeah. on top of the rules that everybody knows about the sport, be it uh, football or basketball or handball or volleyball. And we used to actually mark the teams based on technicality and fair play. Very good. And that's how, you know, <clears throat> when you came away from the camp, what would they, what would they come away with, the, apart from the knowledge? and the, the, the aim was to actually help them to yeah. build projects for after-school activities. Okay. And unfortunately, as I said, after we, the, the funds dried up, we lost contact with many of them. But there were people who were, telling, were sending us reports afterwards, yeah. showing us that I started a club for my, uh, in, in my school. You know, on a Tuesday or on a Monday, I started a, a club uh, oh, to wow. actually uh, instigate dialogue between people and based on sport and all that stuff. So there were people who were interested. And the thing is, with every uh, group of kids, eight or 10 from a country, one of the uh, conditions was to have teachers. Yeah. Because you can't always work only with kids. You have to work with their supervisors. Yeah, of course. Well. Yeah. So the teachers also played their role in terms of uh, assisting those kids to, uh, to use sport in their life more and to use sport as a basis to start in their social life. Mm -hmm. You don't have, not everybody ends up being a Messi or a Ronaldo mm -hmm. or, a, or a Michael Jordan. Or no, a, yeah. but most people everybody would like to. But, exactly. Uh, yeah. Everybody likes to. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> for, for various <laughs> reasons. <laughs> But, you know, when, when you use sport as part of your life, you can end up being a respectable person. You can end up being a person who will make a difference. Yeah. Eventually making a difference, regardless if it's a small difference or a big difference, is what we hopefully most of us will aim for. No, for sure. Yeah. Um, so the family's happier now? But, uh, you know, you, I hope so. You know, they're happy in Doha. And, uh, I hope so. Yeah. Well, my, my daughter is in Sydney as we were taken off, uh, off air. She's doing, uh, she's undertaking her university studies now. Oh, she went back yes. to Sydney. Okay. To study university. I is mean, that to be with your fam Your family still My family, yeah. yes. Okay. All of my family is still there. My part of the family, my wife's side of the family, it's split between Sydney and Lebanon. But okay. she's there with the family. She doesn't want to be anywhere, anywhere near near anybody because <laughs> she wants to focus mostly on her studies. So she's living on campus, but at least she, oh, has, really? <laughs> she has a support network around That's probably her. wise. Yeah. yeah, well, I, th I think yes. <laughs> yeah, no, at that age, you, you yes, can understand course, she course, wants her independence. And... But she has a support network there. Yeah. If anything she needs, there's always people okay. next to her. And you still keep her involved with sport? You're yeah. still in, well. With regards to playing? <laughs> you play with any regards team to playing, sports or uh, any? Uh, no, not, not now. Not no? now. Um, I'm putting probably most of my time on my other kid. Yeah. He's a 12 year old. He takes a lot of uh, energy from us, okay. be it myself or his mom, to try to make sure that he's doing all his activities, mm -hmm. uh, be it in sport or be it in, uh, in music, because he's into both. And um, I try as much as I can. Sometimes I have to admit being lazy also doesn't, <laughs> doesn't help much. Well, I can't blame it on him, but yeah. <laughs> I oh, can't blame lazy. it all on him. No, no, oh, you're me, maybe. Oh, okay. he's, believe oh. me, he's, he's, he's doing he's, more than he can. Oh, really? He has activities almost on a, on a daily basis. Um, but just, I mean, I would like to take this, let's say, chance to try to say, to say to parents, if they can encourage their kids to follow their dreams so they don't end up like someone like me. 
studying many years in, in something and then ended up working in something else, yeah. which is, or it, it always happens. But you hear that a lot. Yeah, of, exactly, know, exactly. Parents put pressure on their children to, to study become, what they feel exactly. is right, but the child has different, 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 different aspirations. Interest. Absolutely. Exactly. So I try with my kids. I mean, my daughter is doing uh, creative writing. Nice. And uh, my son, so far, I mean, he's only 12. He can change oh, absolutely. anyway. But age, so yeah. far, it looks like he ha he's inclined to follow the music path. Yeah. So hopefully he will, he will do that if his passion is there. Is that it's still there because a, now a, his passion is in music. Yeah. If it's still there in a few years, hopefully. Okay. I will support him as much as we yeah, can. Yeah, very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah so. no, I, I'm, I'm totally the same with my children. You know, follow your dreams. Although my oldest is 21 and he's, uh, he's just uh, finishing a media degree. Okay. But he's realized that he's not into it. Yeah, yeah. Because I think he was kind of pressurized, <clears throat> not pressurized, but he just saw what mum and dad did. Okay. Well, um, and just thought, well, that's something that I want to go into. But then yeah. when he's actually doing it, he's just like, actually, it's not for me. So yeah. I said, that's fine. Just finish your degree and then go do and whatever you do, want. Exactly. Do something else. Something I mean uh, that happened with me when I was with my daughter last year, um, trying to look at the universities. We attended a couple of lectures in in the university that she's in now, which is yeah. University of Macquarie in Sydney. And uh, one of the uh, uh, the people that was giving part of a let's say a general information lecture about the university. He was saying that one of the um, directions that the university follows with the kids or with the students is they encourage them not to take more than 30% as their major and right. the rest to take it from different faculties because oh. they realized over the years, and it's a young university, it's only about 40 or 50 years old, not like the university yeah, yeah, that's been the there old, for yeah, hundreds yeah, of years. Yeah. They said that in, in more than 50% of the cases, the student would start in a specific field mm -hmm. and graduates from a different one. Oh, wow. So because they realize, as you said, I mean, maybe your, your son uh, is trying to impress you. Yeah, yeah. Because they say, oh, my dad is in no, media. Absolutely. I want to impress him yeah. because or my mom, I want to impress her. Yeah. Uh, well, and, and after they start, they realize this is not for me. No. And I have a friend whose uh, daughter started in medicine mm. ended up being interior design. Oh, wow. <laughs> so she realized it. medicine is not for her. Yeah. yeah. So she, she shifted to interior design. Mm. So it, it happens. It may happen that kids, for any reason, don't realize that this is not for them until they start university, mm. and which is normal. Hopefully, their parents will actually encourage them to change before it's too late. Yeah. Yeah. Before no, losing sure. another two or three years of their life trying to please someone else when yeah. they could actually develop what they have. Yeah, as absolutely. passion or, or, or skills. Yeah. Um, looking at uh, the athletes that have come from Qatar, have you been impressed by, you know, the whole uh, way Qatar's moving forward? In of course, of course. I mean, I mean uh, I'm a no one to be impressed, but the, the results speak for themselves. Um, uh, of course, people may say that Qatar is going, giving passports left, right and center. But when you can think about the ones who are actually achieving the results, this is not the case. The case, no. like, for example, if we say, if we take Mataz, Mataz yeah. was not a Qatari. Of course, you have Nasser Latia, who was a Qatari. Yeah, yeah. And Nasser is a completely different person. I think for me, Nasser is from out of this world because he's so talented in more than one sport or more than one activity. Yeah. It's not easy to be uh, an Olympic medal winner. Uh, and uh, nine or ten or God knows, I lost count of how many times he won the uh, <laughs> yeah, Middle no, East Championship yeah. in, in rally driving, yeah. uh, of winning Dakar for the last two or three times in, in uh, in the last decade for winning more than once, Dakar is one of the toughest, if not the toughest race in the world yeah. to win. So he's more than uh, in, talented in more than one activity. He's a Qatari. Yeah. But the, the others who people say, oh, they're not Qataris, like Mataz, is, I think he's born in. If, if not born, he came to Qatar when he was very young. Mm. Um, the football team, the football team have been the, oh, that won the Asian yeah, Games. Yeah. They've been in, in Qatar for a long, mm. long time. They've basically, most of them is formed in, in Aspire. So um, Aspire is the, which is the academy. Yeah, so absolutely. It's, but do you think, um, yeah. is there enough people to fill, you know, Qatar's dreams of, Look, you know, stars and stuff? Because it is a small country. And it is, it, can it, I say something? I've, and I want to be blunt here. Yeah, of course, please. I, as I told you, I worked with B in Sports on a couple of events, yeah. international events. One of them is the uh, Winter Olympic Games. There's no bigger event. For, for winter for winter sports no. than the Winter Olympic Absolutely, Games. Yeah. We called it the supermarket the for a simple market? reason. If an athlete cannot make it in their country, they go and knock on someone else's, uh, else's <laughs> door and say, can I rep represent your country? If the rules allow you, why not? 
Yeah, what are the rules? Are there... Yeah. Are, do different countries have different rules? To no, no, it's the rules. I mean, of course, different countries have different rules. Yeah, That's yeah. definitely. Yeah. But, but when I talk Olympic, about the rules, I'm talking about the rules of the sports world. Yes. Be it Olympic or Asian or, what or are any. The, yeah. the rules tell you that if you don't... Well, in general, uh, at least in Olympic Games it does. If you don't represent the country for three years, you can represent any other country you want. If that, of course, if that country accepts you, you can't just say, I want to represent yeah, Zimbabwe yeah, yeah. if Zimbabwe <laughs> doesn't want you. Or you can't say, I want to represent Canada if Canada doesn't want you. So as long as the Olympic Committee of the country that you're trying to represent. Yes, agree. So, and the Sorry. Olympic Committee of the country that you were in, be yeah. it living or, or you're a national of, if they both agree, there's no problem. There's no problem. Yeah. Uh, the reason why I said it's a supermarket, like in, for example, ice skating. Mm -hmm. Holland is one of the best countries in the world. In, oh, absolutely. In I was watching the yeah. ice skating. It's amazing. Yeah. One of the Dutch athletes who could not make it to the national team was representing Canada. Oh, and really? he basically was competing against his old colleagues. So, in the and final. he had no and connection. And, oh, really? <laughs> so, yes. But he, I mean, he's a Dutch who could not make it to the Holland team. So he just chose. He went to Canada. Wow. And Can the Canadians took him. Yeah. I don't think they hesitated for a minute even to take him because he <laughs> no, was a well-known yeah, athlete. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, eventually in, in the Olympic Games or in any major event, there's so many people you can enter. Like in Olympic Games, you cannot enter in general more than two people in any individual event. Okay. So if you have 10, like take Kenya, for example, in running. Mm. Kenya can field two, three teams. Oh, I'm sure. Four absolutely. teams, five They've teams, and they can talent. still all win or have a chance to yeah, win. Yeah, yeah. For me, it's unfair for someone who's been knocking on the door of representation for a few years not to be given another chance Very when true. they can be yeah, given I've never another seen chance. It. I've never looked at it like yeah. that. Yeah. Some people may hate me for it and they say, oh, what happens to national pride and all mm, that stuff? Okay, yeah. national pride, you can always use it. Uh, what I don't agree with is countries, uh, and maybe it happens in, in some cases in Qatar, unfortunately, and I, maybe I'm putting myself in danger now. I, I don't actually agree with someone to be given a passport and been taken away from. So they should give him a chance. If they decide, maybe they want to live in that country for after. Yeah. Which is what happens in a lot of other countries. People say France never won the World Cup in football before it started giving passports, which is wrong because those people were living in France. Yeah. I mean, Zinedine Zidane is Algerian, but if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, he was born in France. And if he, if he oh. was not born, he lived in France since he was five or six. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Mo, yeah, Mo Farah. He's, he's, uh, he's one of the greatest athletes for England, yes. but he's originally from Somalia. That's right, yeah. And he, he went to England, he was six, as, yeah. as, a, as a refugee. He's, he has every right to represent. Yeah, absolutely. But he's living there. Yeah. So hopefully, and I hear that some, now the, the, uh, the whole Qatar environment is actually uh, um, encouraging those athletes to take Qatar as their second home or first home in some cases. Why not? Like no, really. Mataz, Mataz is, I don't think he, he can live anywhere else because it's all he knows. Yeah. All he knows is actually the, the, the Qatari environment. Yeah. So he's, he's a Qatari more than any other Qatari for me. So, and nobody should actually have the right to take that away from him or from any other athlete. So, no, because I heard that, that, you know, once yeah, yeah. you represented the country, then it was... Look, in, in Qatar know. it happens. Eventually, yeah. Qatar cannot really uh, accommodate everybody. No. But in some cases, they're doing it. I mean, yeah. like the handball team that came second in the, in the World Cup, they have the chance. Eventually, the, the athletes may decide, no, I don't want to live here. Yeah, true. But nobody stops him yeah. or her from living here if they, if they want to. Yeah. So, and this is something that uh, it happens a lot. It's just that it's not advertised. That's why people say, oh, no, you give them a passport and then you take them away from mm. it. Yes, it happens in some cases and it should happen in some cases yeah. because you can't accommodate everybody. But no. in some other cases, especially when they achieve, even on a, on a Qatar basis, let's say, or on a Qatar level, even if you achieve in science or in, in, in media, or you're still given the passport. It's not only in sport. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. there okay. are people who okay. are from a different background, but they achieved or they, they achieved something in the name of Qatar, and yeah. they're given passport, which is, by the way, happens in any other country. Yeah, if true. You look, I'm Very true. Being yeah. Australian, yeah. I understand because Australia, Australia yeah. does the same. Yeah. They don't actually go and pinch people around, same as Qatar. They don't go and pinch. They, no. It's called talent identification. There's a process for it. But if somebody is in Australia, not as an Australian, and they achieve something in the name of Australia, there's nothing that stops the government no. from rewarding them by giving them the passport if they don't already go through the normal process of getting the passport. 
And in some countries, it's harder than other countries to get a passport, yeah. which is normal. Yeah, of course. It's, it's, a, it's a world rule that nobody can change. It's, it's mostly <laughs> governed by politics, not by society or by sports. Okay. Yeah, so. um, that's fascinating. So um, moving forward, what have, we, what have we got coming up? Um, oh, there's plenty. And sport-wise, there's plenty. In sport-wise, plenty. absolutely. Plenty. Are plenty you excited? Are you, <laughs> I'm very you know, excited. Yeah. It's, um, you know, after hosting the Asian Games, uh, or the working on the Olympic Games, you start looking for individual sports. I mean, being a football fan, there's no bigger event than the World Cup that's coming in 2020. Oh, yeah, it's going to so be for amazing. Me, this is yeah, the epitome of, yeah. of the sport that I like. Yeah. Um, we have this year uh, the Athletics World Championship. That's right. Coming up in uh, in September, October. Yeah. So are you um, involved with that? I'm not. I was involved. I'm not now because, okay. as I told you, I'm taking it a bit a bit easy. I'm getting too old for that. <laughs> too old. <laughs> not really. I'm just focused. I have other priorities outside, but okay. I was involved at some yeah. stage. And of course, towards the end, if there is a need, the whole Qatar Olympic Committee would be supporting the organizing committee, yeah. which is formed from many of of our colleagues anyway. Okay. Um, also, we have in the next couple of years, we have judo coming, coming oh, really? here with the World Championship. Um, we have swimming coming in 2023. And swimming, we've hosted already the indoor, uh, not the indoor, sorry, the short course. I'm trying to switch in between sports now. Yeah. Uh, swimming, you have the short course, which is the 25 meters. And okay. you have the long course or the normal that everybody knows. And they call the Olympic uh, pool, if you yes, hear yeah. Olympic pool, it's 50 meters. Yeah. So we're hosting the big one. Okay. And not only swimming, you have swimming, you have diving, you have uh, open water, the event that we had last week in, uh, here in, oh, in yes. Doha. Yeah. And uh, you have four or five disciplines, like synchronized swimming, all that, they're all under one umbrella, which is the, the world, the FINA World Swimming Championships, mm -hmm. uh, or the FINA World Championships. So we're hosting, hosting this also in 2023. So there's there's enough. Few. There's enough coming up. Yeah, of course. And of you're course. looking for more you, I'm sure there's always, always, there's always room for more. <laughs> there's always. I mean, in the last few years, if you consider the last few years, we've hosted world championships in table tennis, in um, boxing, in weightlifting, in uh, indoor athletics, yeah. in uh, IPC athletics. IPC is the uh, International Paralympic Committee, so Paralympic athletics, uh, handball. Uh, we've hosted many, many big sports mm. in sailing, uh, 370 sailing, which is one discipline. And I'm talking world, not Asian. That's apart from oh, well, the Asian. Okay. So, yeah. um, and we have, of course, the, the normal events that we host every year. I'm not saying we, when we say we as a country. Yeah, as a country. Um, you have the tennis, the ATP. It has yeah. two of the top tennis uh, events in the world. Mm. Um, you have um, Grand Prix for fencing. And you have many other sports that come here on a regular basis. So I think we're lucky of, uh, with the fact that we live in a country like Qatar, when you can go and watch oh. top level athletes Paying basically oh, yeah. peanuts. Yeah, absolutely. We always <laughs> say that. We're peanuts. very lucky. <laughs> absolutely. Of course. I mean, uh, with tennis, I mean, where would you, where can you go and watch like three or four from the top ten in the world? No. Be it men or women uh, for paying oh, a small amount of absolutely. money. The amount of money that yeah. you pay here. I don't want to no. advertise <laughs> for them, but <laughs> even though they're my colleagues, but uh, it's nothing compared to other events that happen around the world. Yeah. And the access we have here to elite sport is really a blessing for sports fans that we take it for granted sometimes. We do take it for granted. Yeah. But the issue that I find sometimes is that, you know, I miss an event because I, I haven't heard about it, like a big sporting event, because, you know, it's not advertised. Well, it's advertised, yeah. but maybe not enough on a level to actually um, get people to, to hear about it all the time. Yeah. So, of course, there's always a ways one can improve. We try our best, and um, hopefully we'll keep trying. Yeah, we'll no. keep trying. So, <laughs> well, that's great, and that's uh, that uh, kind of finishes nicely for the podcast. Thank you, Louis. Let's keep trying always, and keep on let's, trying. Let's Absolutely, our no, for that's sure. The most important. And I look forward to uh, all these events that are coming up. Too, of course, of course. Because, as you say, it is it is a great opportunity to see these uh, world renowned sports stars coming to of this course. country. Uh, for a good price as well. Yes, just, for a good price. And, and yeah. um, usually we go to uh, stadiums that are not actually overcrowded. No, so it's, no. It's, we, it's like a beauty we, in that case. Like the family, <laughs> we always yeah, go. Yeah. And um, my wife loves to uh, have the uh, Union Jack. Oh, right. Um, so, so she gets in front of the camera. <laughs> Oh, well, she has a chance to do that. So she always, she always loves that. And she gets her little daughter as well to, you know, dress up as well. So That's good. Uh, That's good. Yeah. Hopefully they'll no. continue to do that. Oh, absolutely. No, for sure. So thank you, Louis. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for and, hosting. You know, and 
please Good come luck. in. Keep <laughs> us up to date if uh, there's anything you want to no, share definitely, out definitely. in the future. Definitely, I yeah. will. I will. Right. Thank you for the, the for the platform. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everyone, and we look forward to catching up with you next week. Take care. Bye-bye.